Good evening. I'm Kelly Gear Ripken, National Chair of A Woman's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine's A Woman's Journey, thank you for joining us this evening for our monthly webcast series, Conversations That Matter. You know, A Woman's Journey strives to improve your well being through health education. Incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse are more prevalent than you may have anticipated. Tonight, we are joined by urogynecologist Dr. Grace Chen of the Women's Center for Pelvic Health at Johns Hopkins and Associate Professor of Gynecology and Obstetrics. So please use the Q&A on your screen to ask your questions to the doctor who will respond during the last 20 minutes of tonight's conversation. As always, our webcast will conclude at 8 p.m. I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for their production assistance and you can visit their website for additional lectures and courses throughout the year. And now I am pleased to welcome Dr. Chen. Thank you, Kelly, for that introduction. And even more importantly, thank you for setting up this opportunity for me to engage with our patients. My pleasure. So I don't have any disclosures specific to this talk, um, although I am on Johnson Johnson's Educational Advisory Board. Um, a lot of my work has been supported by agencies such as the National Institute of Health, as well as certain foundational grants, but none of them are relevant to today's talk. So first, um, I think it's important to talk to you guys a little bit about what I do. So what is a female pelvic medicine reconstructive surgeon or urogynecologist? So you can do what I do, either going through gynecology or urology. So you can do a residency in either specialty, and then you do a fellowship. So typically it's two to three years of additional training after residency in specifically urogynecology. And the type of disorders that I treat and do surgery on are pelvic floor disorders. So they include bladder control issues and vaginal support problems. And these are the two topics or conditions that we're primarily gonna focus on today. Although I also help women who have leakage of stool, who have pelvic fistulas, and also do some gender assignment surgery, I'm not really gonna talk about them today. So today's talk, the overview is such that we're gonna first talk about what is pelvic floor. You know, in order for you guys to understand pelvic floor conditions, you should really know a little bit about what the pelvic floor is. And then we'll delve into specifically bladder control issues, as well as pelvic organ prolapse or vaginal prolapse. We'll spend a little bit of time talking also about evaluation and then finally about treatment. And hopefully you'll be amazed by the myriad of treatments that are available. Every, anything from conservative to more surgical type treatments. Besides giving you guys some information about bladder control issues and vaginal support problems, what I really hope you will gain most from today's talk is that although I may focus on these issues, ultimately I'm a women's health champion. So it's important that I and we think about these issues. So I really appreciate Kelly and her team for organizing these sessions. And we should be our own health champions and we should be each other's health champions. So an important step to being a health advocate is to talk about issues that are potentially embarrassing and perhaps in some settings taboo. So that's why I very deliberately titled my talk, Leaking Bladders and Falling Vaginas. And of course, talking about issues is the first step towards taking action. And finally, part of being an advocate and not just a doctor or a surgeon, is to really consider these conditions in the context of a, a woman as an entire person with priorities, goals, and expectations. So consider you individually and not just you as a medical condition. And as a doctor, I should not tell you what to do, but rather empower you and provide you with enough information to arrive at a decision that best fits you individually. So those are 
the themes that I hope will be pervasive through today's talk. All right, so first, what is the pelvic floor? So this is a drawing of what it looks like in a woman's pelvis. And this is as if I were to cut you down the middle lengthwise. And here you see the bladder, the urethra or the opening to the bladder, the vagina, the uterus and the rectum. And what you may appreciate here is there is a band of muscles here called the pelvic floor muscles. And these really support the bladder, the vagina and the rectum. And you can think of it as a big rubber band. It kind of supports everything. Today, I'm not really going to talk about the rectum, but instead, I'm going to focus today's talk on the bladder and the urethra, as well as the vagina and the uterus. And importantly, when we talk about vaginal prolapse, you'll see that we're going to specifically talk about the vagina in terms of the anterior vagina or the part towards the front, the part under the bladder, the apical vagina or the top bit, the part where the uterus comes in. And oftentimes if you've had a hysterectomy, the uterus won't be here, but the top of your vagina will still be there. And then the posterior vagina or the part over the rectum. And it's also important to consider how close everything is. You know, our pelvis is a small area. So the bladder, the uterus, vagina, the rectum, they're all crammed in there. And because they're really close to each other, when one part goes awry, it can oftentimes affect the other parts. So that's also important to keep in mind. Now we're gonna talk about the pelvic floor in a little bit more detail. And this is a drawing as if I were to look at you straight on. So here you see the bladder, and then the uterus, and then the rectum. So before you, you know, it was a drawing of you sideways. This is a drawing of you full front. And what you cannot see here is that all of these organs, again, lay on top of your pelvic floor muscles. So that's why these supports are really important when it comes to talking and understanding these conditions. And as I mentioned, these pelvic floor muscles act like a rubber band, or in this case, a hammock that supports all of your pelvic organs. So then what happens when you have a weakness in the support muscles or a tear in the connective tissue or damage to the nerves, that's when you can develop conditions such as bladder control problems. And specifically, we're talking about urinary incontinence, so leakage of urine. And leakage of urine, I'll talk more further, can be related to stress incontinence or urge incontinence. We're also going to be talking about overactive bladder problems. In addition to bladder control problems, we'll also talk about pelvic organ prolapse or vaginal support issues, vaginal prolapse. And as I alluded to earlier, you know, it is helpful to think about the vagina in three compartments, the anterior, which is the part under the bladder, the posterior, which is the part over the rectum, and then the apical or the top bit. And that oftentimes, if you still have a uterus, that's obviously where your uterus will be. And as I mentioned, we're not really gonna be talking about bowel issues. Well, I think the first thing to understand about these conditions is that they are highly prevalent. So this is a graph um, in the X axis here. It shows decades of life. So 30 years old, 40 years old, 50, so forth and so on. And then in the Y axis here, it shows doctor consultations per year. And the bluish graph is basically the population in 2000. And then the more yellow red graphs are the population in 2030. And so the first thing to note is that obviously our population is getting older. You know, people are living longer. So the proportion of women who are in their 70s and 80s and, and 60s will increase um, proportionally in the next you know, 20 to 30 years. The next thing to note is that the consultation for pelvic floor disorder, so bladder issues, vaginal issues, increases as you get older. So it's estimated that there are greater than 200 million women worldwide with these issues. And so some of you guys may have noted that there was a director of a global women's health fellowship in my title. 
And so in addition to doing work here, I do a lot of educational work in Sub-Saharan Africa and in India, because in those places, you know, the, there aren't really a lot of urogynecologists, if any. And obviously, this is a huge issue, not only for U.S.-based women, but women worldwide. The demand will care for care will increase by 35 percent. And again, a lot of this has to do with the population getting older. It's estimated that there are greater than 1.6 million new doctor visits per year for these conditions. Um, and it's estimated that we spent more than $20 billion on these conditions. So, you know, the message here is if you have these conditions or know people who have, you and they are not alone. So another way of thinking about how common this issue is that depending on what study you read, it's estimated to affect up to 50% of women. And as I've alluded to, it increases with increasing age. And just to give you guys perspective, this is more common than heart disease, more common than diabetes, and certainly more common than any cancers. Now, despite this high prevalence, only about 10 to 20% of women with these issues seek care. And why is that? Well, you know, as I have alluded to, it's a bit of an embarrassing issue. You know, as women, we're all pretty modest. We don't generally talk about our vaginas. Um, well, of course I do on a daily basis, but most of us don't. Um, you know, a lot of us think that, well, it's just a normal part of aging, a normal part of being a woman. And, and you know, I did show you guys that as we get older, of course, your risk of developing these issues do increase. However, it is not normal. And it is also important to think that these conditions really do impact quality of life. And also importantly, especially in older women, it may increase the risk for falls. And falls actually have been related and associated with that. So again, you know, it is primarily a quality of life issue, but it's not just a quality of life issue. Um, and as I have alluded to, you know, up to two thirds of women have not discussed these issues with a doctor. And so again, this is why I'm especially grateful to Kelly and her team for really giving me the opportunity to talk about these conditions. And women typically wait more than six years before getting help for these conditions. Now I'm also gonna present some data on how common these type of surgeries are. Um, so in this graph here, again, in the x-axis, you see age ranges by decades. And then in the y-axis, this is the cumulative incidence of surgery. And obviously, you know, as we get older, again, cumulatively, your increased risk for having surgery for these conditions, up to a greater than 10%, you know, by the time you're almost in your uh, 80 years. And it's estimated that there are greater than 300,000 surgeries performed per year for these type of issues. The lifetime risk of surgery is about 20% or so. And just so that you have something for comparison, the lifetime risk for breast cancer is about 15%. So again, you know, these are really common conditions and common surgeries. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about bladder control problems. And the two type of conditions I'm gonna talk about are stress urinary incontinence, and then overactive bladder and urge incontinence. So first, what is stress incontinence? So stress incontinence is the involuntary loss of urine with any increases in intra-abdominal pressure. So put simply, it's leakage of urine when you sneeze, cough, laugh, change positions, walking or running. And so I think this graphic really exemplifies that well. So anytime you're using these um, abdominal muscles, you may leak urine. So this is stress incontinence. In contrast, overactive bladder or urge incontinence is basically the feeling of sudden urgency with and without leakage. So there are women out there who may have overactive bladder, meaning that they feel the sudden strong urge to urinate and they feel an increase in frequency of urination, but they actually make it to the toilet. So they don't necessarily leak urine 
And there are certainly women out there with overactive bladder, meaning they feel these urgency and frequency symptoms, but they don't make it. So they may leak on their way to the toilet. And other conditions that are associated with that include nocturia, which is just waking up more than once at nighttime to urinate. And as I have alluded to, urge incontinence just refers to the sudden and involuntary loss of urine. So typically your bladder should really stay relaxed until you're ready to urinate. But with overactive bladder or urgency incontinence, you know, you always feel that involuntary bladder contraction. So you always feel the urge to urinate. Um, and a lot of these women, they feel gotta go, gotta go. And oftentimes when they're in the highway, you know, or at a shopping mall, all they see are bathroom signs or all they're looking for are places where they can use the toilets. When you have both of these conditions and many, if not most women have both, it's called mixed incontinence, okay? Meaning that they have both stress incontinence symptoms as well as overactive bladder urge incontinence symptoms. And again, it's really important to understand that even though these are related conditions, they're actually two separate conditions. So the treatment options are different. And as I alluded to, you know, the, because the treatment options are different, oftentimes where we start is we start with whatever condition is most bothersome to the patient. So if someone has more bothersome stress incontinence symptoms, then we may start with this treatment versus if they have more bothersome overactive bladder, then obviously we'll start with that. And finally, pelvic organ prolapse or vaginal prolapse. And as I alluded to, this can happen in the anterior vagina, the posterior vagina, or the apical or the top of the vagina. And oftentimes women with these issues present with feeling of a bulge, pressure, or heavy sensation in the vagina. And oftentimes they'll tell me that they feel these symptoms more at the end of the day when they've been on their feet a lot, or when they've been you know, physically active. Um, the women may describe it as sitting on a ball. Now, other symptoms that women may have include having back pain. Um, some women may have more vaginal discharge and spotting. Um, some may have some discomfort or lack of sensation during intercourse. And depending on the location of prolapse, so if your prolapse is anterior, and remember this is the part under the bladder, you know, women may have issues with urination. If it's posterior, and this is the part over the rectum, women may have issues with defecation. Now, these symptoms here, the back pain, discharge, discomfort, you know, these symptoms are not very specific for prolapse, meaning that obviously you can have vaginal discharge and spotting without prolapse. Really the most specific symptom for prolapse is feeling of a bulge. Um, similar to the bladder control issues, these conditions are not life-threatening, but it obviously affects quality of life. I'm going to show you some drawings of what this looks like. So these are, again, drawings as if I were to cut you down the middle lengthwise. So these are sagittal planes. And here, the picture on the left, you see what normal vagina looks like, and uterus, rectum, and then the bladder. And then here you see what an anterior prolapse looks like. So this is, again, the vagina that's right under the bladder. And here you see what posterior prolapse look like. So again, this is the vagina under the or over the rectum. And then here you see a depiction of what uterine or apical prolapse looks like. So this is the prolapse of the vagina at the top. And again, if a woman still has a uterus, this could include a uterus, but even without a uterus, so this is without the uterus, you can see the top of the vagina can also prolapse. Now I'm gonna show you guys a photograph of what this looks like. Um, so, so far I've just shown you drawings. So this is a photograph of what severe or complete vaginal prolapse looks like. So basically, this is an E version of the entire vagina. And you can see that for women who are unaware of these conditions, how distressing this can be. You know, I've ha had so many women come, you know, very distressed, thinking that they have cancer. 
Um, and obviously the, the best news I can tell them is this is not cancer, this is prolapse. So again, this is when the entire vagina basically has turned inside out. And both vaginal prolapse and bladder control issues really can affect quality of life. They can affect quality of life in physical ways, limiting physical activities. You know, as I've alluded to stress incontinence, right? Leakage with coughing, laughing, and including exercise, right? You know, women may not want to exercise because they leak urine. Same thing with prolapse. You know, prolapse can get worse if you um, are exercising. And so again, they may restrict themselves because of that. Um, it can impact uh, your sexual activity. Um, you know, sometimes these conditions can be so distressing that it can lead to absences from work and decreased productivity. Um, obviously, these can impact you personally. Um, you know, if you have significant leakage of urine, you may have to wear special, uh, you know, obviously things like uh, diapers, you may need to get special bedding. Um, there's a lot of psychological distress with this you know, uh, depression, loss of self-esteem, negative body image. Um, oftentimes, especially older women with these conditions, um, they're afraid that they're going to be a burden to their family. You know, the leakage of urine and vaginal discharge that may occur can, you know, be, be embarrassing, can cause an odor, um, can be quite irritating to the skin. And then finally, you know, uh, these conditions really do impact social interactions as well. Um, you know, I've had many women tell me that they have really withdrawn from both friends and family just because they were so embarrassed by this and, and didn't know what was going on. And then, you know, as we talked about in overactive bladder, so people that feel like they have to urinate all the time, you know, they're constantly looking for the toilet. And that could really inhibit um, their ability to travel. So now I'm going to talk about some of the risk factors that are associated with these issues. So the most common and well-established risk factors are pregnancy and childbirth. And here in this drawing here, you know, you can clearly see why having a, a baby's head <laughs> passing through the birth canal can absolutely lead to damage and tears in the supports of the vagina. Aging, you know, I, all those graphs I showed you earlier about how these conditions are more common as we get older. And, and obviously being a woman, right, the way we are built and genetics, of course, plays a role. Now, in addition, there's a lot of data that show weight um, can play a role in this. And if you think about this logically, you know, if you carry a lot of weight, especially in the abdomen, there's a lot of pressure, uh, constant pressure on the pelvis. And so these can, you know, all lead to pelvic floor disorders. And it's important to note that even though these are all risk factors, not one in isolation typically leads to prolapse. So these are conditions, what we call multifactorial, meaning there are really a lot of different risk factors that together will lead to these conditions. So it's typically not just one. Now, there are other risk factors that are less well understood, but we believe that they are indeed risk factors, such as constipation. And again, if you think about this logically, you know, if you are doing a lot of straining to have bowel movements, again, you're putting a lot of pressure on that pelvic floor, right? And remember, I alluded to the pelvic floor like it's a rubber band supporting all your pelvic organs. And if you're constipated or you know, you're know you doing a lot of smoking, you're, you're putting a lot of stress on your, your rubber band down there. And so eventually this rubber band is gonna get loose, right? And things won't function normally. Um, so smoking, as I've alluded to, is another risk factor. And certainly if you do a lot of high impact sports, or, you know, in women that I help treat in Sub-Saharan Africa or in South Asia, you know, a lot of them do a lot of heavy lifting, right? They're farmers. And so, again, there's some data to support that this can all lead to pelvic floor issues. If you have chronic coughs. So, again, all of these mechanisms are related to putting a lot of pressure on the pelvic floor. And then finally, there are certain type of medications like blood pressure medications um, that could contribute to bladder control issues. 
Now, the reason why some of these risk factors are highlighted in red is that these are risk factors are potentially modifiable, meaning that potentially, you know, if you lost some weight, you know, your bladder control issues may get better. You know, if you take better care of the constipation issues, if you stop smoking, et cetera. Whereas obviously risk factors like pregnancy and childbirth, aging, and, and being a woman genetics, you, you can't change those, at, at least not yet. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what are the evaluation involved in treating these conditions. So the first and most important thing to note is that the evaluation for these conditions are pretty simple, and most of them can be completed in a clinic visit. And, you know, typically it's as simple as first asking, are you bothered by urine leakage or urinating, urinating too frequently? Are you bothered by feeling a bulge in the vagina? You know, and if you answer yes to any of these issues, then I would say talk to your doctor about it. In terms of coming to the clinic, um, obviously with every condition, we do a detailed history and clinical examination. And typically this examination is a pelvic exam. And obviously you guys are all very familiar with a, what a pelvic exam is like. And that may include a speculum exam. Now, what you may not have experienced is some bladder specific type of pelvic exams. So typically we, again, depending on your symptoms, may measure a post-roid residual. So this just means that after you urinate, we check you to see how well you're urinating. We may check your urine to make sure that there is no evidence of infection. You know, sometimes a urinary tract infection can lead to frequency urgency symptoms. So can lead to overactive bladder-like symptoms. Now, again, depending on your symptoms and your conditions, we may do some urodynamic testing. So this is really a test of your bladder function. So it lets us know how much your bladder can hold, so the bladder capacity. It also confirms whether or not you do indeed have leakage with you know, coughing, et cetera. Um, we may look inside your bladder, and this is a procedure called cystoscopy. And again, both of these are uh, tests that we could do in clinic. There are certain instances in which you may have to get radiographic tests, such as an ultrasound or MRI. So again, the big message here is that if the evaluation is simple and mostly completed in clinic. All right, so let's then end with talking about treatments. So again, the big message here is to know that these conditions are very common, but they are not an inevitable part of aging, meaning that if you're bothered by it, you can get treated for them. And the treatments range from conservative options, such as pelvic floor muscle exercises and medication, to procedures that can be performed in clinic and to surgeries, of course. And we'll go through each of these in more detail. These conditions have a range of severity. You know, I have some women that you know leak just a couple of drops a day, and it doesn't bother them. So, you know, the treatment itself should really be tailored to the amount of bother and impact these conditions are causing for you, as well as your specific goals and expectations. You know, we all have different priorities, so I think it's really important that we individualize treatments. And the first treatment option I want to mention, which most people don't think about, is expect a management or do nothing. You know, if these, even if you have stress incontinence, or even if you have, a, you know, mild vaginal collapse, if it's not bothering you, it's okay to potentially do nothing or to wait and see. And by doing nothing, I don't actually really mean doing nothing. I mean, you know, doing things like trying to maintain a normal weight, if you're a smoker, trying to quit smoking, if you're having constipation, you know, manage your constipation. Um, if you are in a line of work that do a lot of heavy lifting, you know, use proper lifting techniques. So this should remind you of all those prevention strategies we talked about earlier when we talked about risk factors for developing these conditions. 
In addition to quote unquote doing nothing, one thing I always urge all of my patients to do, all of my friends, my nurses, my medical assistants, is pelvic floor muscle exercises. You know, to me, this is a good thing to do, irrespective of honestly whether or not you have these conditions. But certainly, if you have these conditions, even if you're not bothered, I think it's reasonable to do pelvic floor muscle exercises. Um, and again, we already talked about how important the pelvic floor muscles are. And these are really exercises that aim to strengthen muscles that you know, help with bladder issues and vaginal supports. And these exercises are helpful for both stress incontinence as well as the urgency incontinence and may also be helpful for vaginal prolapse. Now, many of you may know these exercises as Kegel exercises. Oftentimes, you know, up to 50% of women can't really squeeze these muscles adequately or can't locate them, you know, because again, they're hidden, right? They're in the pelvis and it's really hard to feel them. So it may be helpful to work with a pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, so most, you know, women that see me don't realize that there are physical therapists that specializes in the bladder and in vaginal support issues. And they're really quite uh, facile are at teaching patients how to control these muscles well, and also how to use these muscles. In addition to this, you can also work with a physical therapist to retrain your bladder. So for example, for patients who have overactive bladder issues where they're urinating every hour, you can actually retrain your bladder to gradually lengthen the duration between voids. So every hour to an hour, 15 minutes, hour, 30 minutes, so forth and so on. Additionally, you know, sometimes as we get older, we, we kind of forget about the bladder, so to speak. You know, we, we don't feel when the bladder is telling us that it's time to go before it's too late and we, you know, wet ourselves. And so sometimes you can use what we call prompted or time voids. And what this basically is, is setting a, a timer, you know, like on a cell phone to go off every you know, two and a half or so uh, hours to remind you to urinate. So even if you don't feel the urge to go, you know, when your cell phone goes off, you go ahead and go use the toilet. And those type of strategies, especially for older women and, and older women in nursing homes, may be quite effective in decreasing leakage. Another conservative option that I like to talk about is fluid and diet management. Now, this is primarily for, you know, overactive bladder, urge incontinence type symptoms. And the first thing I do want to point out is that there's not a ton of evidence supporting this, okay? But this is one of those treatment options or strategies that, you know, what's the harm, right? There's no harm in doing it. And even if there's not a ton of evidence, a lot of patients tell me that this is actually really effective for their conditions. And so the first thing is, don't drink too much fluid. So drink when thirsty. So, you know, our bodies are very smart. If you drink extra fluid it doesn't need, guess what? It just makes you go to the bathroom more. It makes you urinate it out. So it's really important to check in with your body so that you don't become dehydrated, but only drink when you're thirsty. Now, in terms of drinking, obviously not fluid not all fluids are made equal. So there are certain fluids that could irritate the bladder more. So for example, caffeinated or even decaffeinated teas and coffees. You know, this may make you feel like you have to urinate more. Um, alcohol, acidic fruits, spicy foods, carbonated drinks, artificial sweeteners. So really, again, there's a whole list of things that potentially can irritate our bladder and make us feel the urge to urinate more. So again, addressing more of the overactive bladder issues. But I caution that number one, there's not a lot of evidence, right? So we don't really know if indeed eliminating alcohol is gonna entirely solve your bladder control issues. Second thing is, you know, I, I give a list very similar to this to all my patients. It's a generic list, but everyone's bladder is different, right? So if you wanna do some fluid and diet management, I would eliminate one thing at a time and see if it makes a difference. So for example, eliminate coffee for a few days. And if your overactive bladder symptoms get better, then you know that coffee is indeed a bladder irritant for you. The other thing I will say is, I think it's important to put things in perspective. So these are quality of life issues. 
you know, and, and as a doctor and as a surgeon, I drink a lot of coffee. I would be miserable if I didn't have my coffee. So, you know, even if the coffee may end up irritating your bladder, if you're going to be miserable, if you don't have your coffee, then, you know, maybe instead of cutting it out, just cut it down. So again, you have to make those type of judgment calls. Now, another treatment option, this one can be done in the clinic um, and potentially at home. This is for specifically stress incontinence. So again, this is the leakage with coughing, laughing. And these are pessaries. So pessaries are made of silicon. And here you see some pictures of what they look like. And the idea behind them is that you put them inside the vagina and there's a little knob here, which basically pushes the opening of the bladder against the pubic bone hopefully decreasing any leakage episodes. And typically this is something that, you know, you will have to get fitted in clinic with a, a physician or a nurse practitioner. And then we teach you how to manage it on your own at home. And this is also something that could be used for vaginal prolapse, which I'll explain more later. Um, and studies have shown that this is actually pretty successful and it's pretty comparable to physical therapy, you know, so comparable to pelvic floor muscle exercises. Stress incontinence treatment, which some of you may know is the poison pressa. So this is a over the counter device and it's similar to the pessary in the sense that this is also placed inside the vagina. Now the pessary is reusable, whereas this is disposable. And you know the idea is similar that it basically, this thing pushes the bladder against the pubic bone to hopefully decrease um, the bladder leakage. Um, there's very limited data on how efficacious it is. Um, it's you know over the counter, so it's not typically covered by insurance. And a lot of women, especially older women, tell me that this actually is quite irritating um, in the vagina. Another treatment option for stress incontinence, and this one can be done in the clinic setting, um, are urethral bulking procedures. So basically a bulking agent, so methyl cellulose or, you know, we used to use collagen in the past, can be injected inside the opening of the bladder to bulk it up, thereby decreasing urinary leakage. And again, the great nice thing about this is it can be done in the office. Um, and you know, obviously if women can't tolerate this office, then we can do it in the operating room. The bad thing about this is that it does need to be repeated. So depending on what we're using, anywhere from six months to seven years. So it's not permanent. So over time, your body will degrade these. Finally, the gold standard for stress incontinence treatment is sling procedure. And so what a sling does is it basically supports the opening of the bladder or the urethra so that when you cough and sneeze, you know, instead of things being not supported and you leak, if you put it in a sling, you'll support that area leading to no incontinence. And this is very effective and durable. Um, so typically this does not need to get repeated, although you know there is always a chance of failure. And really it's the most commonly performed procedure done for stress urinary incontinence. So it's the gold standard, as I mentioned. Um, and this is typically done in the operating room and it's typically an outpatient procedure. So it can be done under general anesthesia or even a spinal anesthesia. I also want to talk a little bit about medications. Um, and this time I'm going to change shift gears and talk about urge incontinence or overactive bladder. So there are two common classes of medications for this condition. One, they're called anti-muscarinics. Um, the other name for them is anticholinergics. And I'm sure if you look at this list of names, I'm sure you've come across these. Now, these medications work, you know, 60 to 70 percent of the time. Um, but they're limited a lot by their side effects. And one of the more important side effects is that they could cause cognitive issues, especially in older women. So it really does limit their use. A newer class of medication is called the beta-3 receptor agonist. And you know, these are a couple of those medications in that class. Um, 
Now, one of these medications could elevate your blood pressure. So if you get started on them, you should have your blood pressure checked. The other medication in this class, the Gemtessa, does not elevate your blood pressure. Um, and then finally, you know, something that you may come across is called, uh, it, it's called a pure WIC. And this is primarily used for people who have a lot of nighttime issues. And so it's an external catheter, which is connected to a section device. And basically this thing is placed up against the vaginal opening and it basically wicks away the urine that happens primarily you know, after you go to sleep. Um, I will tell you that you know, there is a very, very limited data on how efficacious this is. Um, it theoretically helps with nighttime voids and potentially falls, right? Because in the nighttime, if you're getting up scrambling to use the toilet, you're, you may be at increased risk for falls. And if you don't have to get up because of this, it could potentially decrease that. Um, but it's not covered by most insurances. Um, another procedure that is being done for urgency, incontinence, or overactive bladder, and this can be done in the clinic setting, are basically Botox injections. So, you know, you hear about people getting Botox on their faces. Well, you can also get Botox in your bladder. Um, and again, this is just done in the clinic. And it, the idea is that it paralyzes the bladder muscle so it doesn't spasm and cause a lot of frequency of urination and bladder leakage. Um, the problem, of course, is that it does, does have to get repeated every six months to two years. Uh, and it can be done in the office, as I have alluded to. Um, and then if you can't tolerate it in the office, obviously in the operating room. Another option for urgency incontinence or overactive bladder is PTNS. This is percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. So I think of this kind of like acupuncture. You know, you go to the clinic, you have a tiny um, lead that gets uh, placed over your ankle. And basically, you sit there and, you know, you get this done every week for up to 12 weeks. So it is a doctor's visit every week. And typically the uh, visit is about 30 minutes. And I actually have done this to myself just because I was curious what it feels like. And it, you know, it just kind of makes your feet or toes tingle a little bit. So it's very well tolerated and it's done in the office. And then finally, the last procedure for urgency incontinence or overactive bladder is called sacral nerve stimulation. And I tell most patients, this is like a pacemaker that you can place around your back. And basically the you know, lead here, the pacemaker stimulates the nerves that go to the bladder in order to calm them down. So in order that you don't have frequency urgency symptoms. Um, and this typically has to be done in the operating room and it requires two steps. So the first step is that we put in a lead and we see if it works. And then the, if it does work, meaning that, you know, you get benefit from it, then the second step is we actually place in the pacemaker cell or the battery. Um, and as I mentioned, this is typically done in the operating room, um, but it can be done under local anesthesia and conscious sedation. So you don't have to be put to sleep for it. And then finally, I do want to talk about some treatment options for prolapse. So as I alluded to, pessaries can also be used for prolapse. So before we talked about pessaries for stress urinary incontinence, and these are pessaries that are used for prolapse. Um, they're fitted in the clinic, and then we teach you how to manage it yourself. And I tell most women that fitting pessaries, it's like the Goldilocks rule of fitting, meaning it's a little bit of a trial and error. We have to find the perfect size as well as shape for your anatomy. And once you're fitted with the right one, you know, you take it out about once a week at home. Now, if you can't manage to do this on your own, so a lot of older ladies can't manage this, you can actually have this managed by a doctor and generally we'll see you every three months or so. And it's really a great option if you're not ready for surgery or if you don't want surgery. I'm gonna talk a little bit about surgeries. And you know, the most important message to know about any surgeries, be it for bladder issues or for vaginal prolapse, is that there's a lot of options. And there's a lot of options first with the route of surgery. So, you know, this is a, a belly where there's a big cut, so we can make a cut into your belly. So this is called a abdominal incision. Um, it can be done laparoscopically. So these are with little cuts. It can also be done robotically, which many of you heard of. 
uh, which are which is similar to laparoscopic surgery, except you know we do this with the aid of a robot. And then finally, it can also be done vaginally. So everything can be through the vagina. So there's absolutely no cuts on the outside at all. And I think when you're thinking about surgeries, you know, now we've already talked about that. You can think about the surgery in terms of the different routes of surgery. So either open incision, laparoscopic or robotic, or it can be done vaginal. Um, you know, these surgeries can also be done with or without a hysterectomy. Um, you can think about using mesh or not using mesh. Uh, you can think about leaving the vagina open or closing off the vagina. Now, closing off the vagina may seem like an odd option, but it's great for somebody who's not interested in sexual activity. And you know, the key to all of this is that this is a process that is a shared decision-making process. So the key here is that there's a lot of surgical options and a lot of effective options. And how we decide is not based on what me as a surgeon telling you what to do, but rather you and I discussing options and your priorities and then making a shared decision. And then I'm just gonna show you some pictures of what these surgeries look like. So this one is called a sacrocopalpexy, and this is usually done through the belly, but again, can be done laparoscopically or robotically. And in essence is placing a piece of material or mesh on the vagina and lifting it up to your tailbone. Um, and as I indicated, we can also do this vaginally. So there's no mesh involved when we do vaginal surgery. And basically this is lifting up the vagina towards your own ligaments. Now, depending on your prolapse, you know, you can also do uh, application. And application, the way to think about this is that it's like, I'm gonna create a corset with your own tissue to cinch everything in. So this is all done vaginally. And then remember how I mentioned that we can also close off your vagina. So this is a picture of what that looks like. You see, here's the vagina open, and then here is it closed off. And this procedure is called a cobalclysis. Now, again, this may seem like something that's barbaric, but it's actually a great option for somebody who's not interested in vaginal intercourse. And again, from the outside, it doesn't look like anything's different, but it's just, you know, instead of the vagina being open, it's closed. But again, on the outside, everything looks the same. Now, I do wanna spend just a minute talking about what happens after surgery. So it's important to note that most surgeries are outpatient or an overnight stay. And if you work, you know, depending on your surgery, you may have to take a couple of days off to up to a month off. Apart from pelvic rest, meaning nothing in the vagina, so no intercourse, no tampons, you can really resume activities immediately. And by that, you know, this is what I mean. Number one, you should walk on the day of surgery if you feel up to it with help oftentimes. Number two, you really should listen to your body. So let's say you feel like going out for a walk, you know, maybe walk five, 10 minutes, stop, see how you feel. But there's really no restriction per se. You do need to use your common sense. So if you're going to do something that could be potentially strenuous, eh, you may want to hold off on that until you're more healed. And then the last thing is, you know, whatever you feel like doing, use proper technique. So if you're going to engage in some exercises, engage your core, you know, before you, while you're doing these activities. It's also important to note that before and after surgery, it's really important to optimize nutrition and overall health. How you heal after surgery is very much dependent on, on how healthy you are before surgery. So some take home messages, bladder control problems and vaginal prolapse are common. You're not alone. You, it is okay. And in fact, you should talk about it if you're bothered. The decision to treatment options should be a shared one. It should be patient-centered, you, you and your doctor and your family should work together to decide on the best treatment options for you. Again, we talked about how the evaluations are simple and can usually be completed in the office. Um, and it's important to know that even if you have these issues, if you're not bothered by it, potentially you don't really require treatment, but it's always good to get an evaluation and know your options. And as we talked about, there is a lot of treatment options, both 
from conservative all the way to surgery. And again, this is not an inevitable part of aging. So don't just put up with it if it bothers you. And then I, I'm sure Kelly will share this with you guys, but here are some numbers um, that, you know, in case you or your family members or friends have these issues, uh, please do call us and at least get an evaluation. Um, you know, we see patients uh, at virtually all Hopkins locations. And then this is a website to some of the patient information that we have developed um, for you guys. So please uh, do look it up. And then here are just some other websites that are useful, both from the NIH, so National Institute of Health, as well as from the American Urogynecologic Society. So people that do what I do are part of this group. All right, well, thank you for your attention. I know that was a lot, um, but you know, it, it's a, I, I hope you get the sense that not only is it a really common issue, um, there's a lot of treatment options, you know, so don't be afraid to seek care just because you're afraid of surgery, because I presented lots of options that are not surgical. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Wow, wonderful presentation um, and very important information. So we're going to jump right to it if, you, if you're ready. Yep. Um, okay, so we've got a question from Helen. And she'd like to know, if you have urinary incontinence during pregnancy, does this imply that you will have it throughout your life? Yeah, great question. So if you have it during pregnancy, certainly after a pregnancy, while your body is still trying to get back to normal, you may continue to have it. Um, and typically, you know, after about six to 12 months, if you continue to have these issues, then you may continue to have them, of course. But if you have them only up to six months or nine months, then they actually may resolve after that. Now, let's say that they do resolve after you know, six months. So you have them during pregnancy, you have them after pregnancy, but after six months, they're gone. Does that mean that you may have them later on in life? And yes, the, the answer is your risk for having these issues again as you get older does increase. It's not inevitable, meaning it's not 100%, but it does increase. So really what you're saying that, you know, during pregnancy or you, you, you know, if you do have incontinence, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have it later on, but um, just age in general is your, your risk factor goes up just as you're aging in general. Exactly. Yeah. So right after you give birth, you may continue to have incontinence for a period mm -hmm. of time, but yep. that may go away. And if it does, great. But as you get older, it may come back. <laughs> it may come back. Everything comes back when you get older, right? Unfortunately, um, so. Yes. Um, okay, great. Our next question is from Carol. She said, you mentioned that um, vaginal birth can add to the risk of getting in incontinence and, and uh, vaginal prolapse. So does this mean that you should get a C-section? Mm, great question. Um, so I would say the decision to either have a vaginal delivery or C-section should be also a shared um, decision-making, right? It should be something that you discuss with your obstetrician. We do know that C-sections can be protective for these conditions, but remember, childbirth is just one risk factor that may predispose you to getting these conditions. So there's obviously other risk factors like getting older, like genetics, right? Um, that you can't control just because you have a C-section. And so I never tell patients that they should get C-section, but you should certainly mention it to your obstetrician. Um, and it's something that, again, you know, should be individualized. Great. So along that line too, later on, or not even later on, what if uh, a, a woman has to get a hysterectomy or, or does it necessarily have to get a hysterectomy, but maybe chooses to for lots of different reasons, just doesn't want to deal with spotting, whatever, right? Lot, let's, we could go on and on with that, but um, does a hysterectomy, can, can that cause incontinence or a vaginal prolapse as well? Yeah, so the data behind it isn't great. 
But yes, there's absolutely evidence that show that getting a hysterectomy for whatever reason, like fibroids, you know, that's a common reason, right. can mm-hmm. predispose you to having bladder control issues as well as prolapse, ap- you know, later on in life, like after your hysterectomy. So yes, that that can absolutely be the case. But again, does that mean you shouldn't get a hysterectomy? Well, no, right? Like if you have to get a hysterectomy because you're having heavy bleeding and you've tried everything else, then you should mm-hmm. still get a hysterectomy. Right. So perhaps that's when um, they can talk about doing maybe that sling that you talked about, the mesh sling. Um, talk, speak a little bit about that. If, if someone was going to go that route or, um, you know, and they were concerned about that, what would you recommend? Would you recommend them to go ahead and get that done? Yeah, so I would say that if you already are having, let's say, stress incontinence symptoms, Mm-hmm. Um, and are anticipating undergoing a hysterectomy, let's say for fibroids, then mm-hmm. yes, absolutely, we can, you know, perform both procedures at the same time. Now, you know, I am a urogynecologist, but I'm also a gynecologist. So obviously, I can do the hysterectomy and do the sling. Or if you have a gynecologist already, then I'm happy to go into the operating room and do the sling at the same time you get your hysterectomy with your gynecologist. Good to know. Very, very good to know. So um, our next question is from Regina, and she'd like to know, are there racial differences in pelvic floor disorders? Yeah, so, you know, race is one of those things where there's a lot that is unknown and unclear, right? Because I, you know, when I went to medical school school now decades ago, you know, race was considered a biologic construct. But now we feel we understand it's more of a social and and some would even argue political construct. Right. So, yes, while there are racial differences, you know, I don't know that these are biologic. Right. They can be related to what race is oftentimes a proxy for, you know, like certain social determinants of health. Just as an example. You know, I mentioned I do a lot of work in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia, and those women there, there's a ton of prolapse. The prevalence is really high. But is that a racial difference or is it because, you know, they all work in the farm and have to carry these huge loads every day, right? right? So it's hard to tease that out. But yes, we think that there are racial differences. But again, it doesn't seem like it's biologic. It may be more related to other variables. Mm-hmm. More like environmental. Area. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but it's such a complex issue and it's not mm-hmm. something we have a good handle on. And I, and I will tell you that, you know, one of the areas of study for me is barriers to care, right? There's a lot of health disparities and that we know for a fact that there's huge health disparities, especially when it comes to pelvic floor disorders. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So um, Luann wants to know, does having sex slash intercourse strengthen the pelvic floor muscles? You know, that's interesting. Um, not that we know of per <laughs> se, um, only because it's it's hard to know, you know, during intercourse. I mean, that could mean so many things to so many people, right? right. And, and you're not necessarily always using your pelvic floor muscles in intercourse. Again, you know, it, it's such a vague term, right? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. And so, so the whole concept of, you know, uh, lose it if you don't use it, uh, I'm not right. sure that that right. is completely relevant here. Um, now, having said that, it doesn't mean you should be discouraged from having sex, right? Yeah, that's true. I actually think it's a great question because um, you wouldn't know, actually. You would, yeah. you would think that you are using your pelvic floor muscles. You would think that. And maybe some of you are, you know, during certain types of intercourse. Yeah, yeah. So, well, thank you for that. Um, our next question from Susan, she wants to know, can stress incontinence go away without any interaction? Yeah, so I will say that all of these symptoms waxes and wanes, right? There are some days in which you may be more bothered, other days in which it may be less. I have patients that, you know, they see me, they do their Kegels, things get better, and their symptoms, quote unquote, resolve for a few years, and then they come back. And so, you know, it's not like cancer, where if you don't treat it, you know, it doesn't go away. A lot of times these symptoms do wax and wane, and certainly the amount of bother they have for you and the amount of impact that they may have for you may also differ. Right. 
Well, thank you very much. And Dr. Chen, unfortunately, it looks like we're running out of time. We're close to the eight o'clock hour. So much information though that you uh, gave to our audience and uh, just really lovely. So I wanna take this time to, to thank you so much for speaking with us tonight and about such important issues. And like you said, issues that lots of women really just don't wanna talk about for all kinds of reasons. So thank you for that. Um, so Dr. Chen also has graciously agreed to respond to any of the unanswered questions that were asked this evening. So in a couple of weeks, you'll receive an email outlining the outstanding questions and answers. At the same time, we'll also put the website that she had put up on the slide and the phone numbers. So uh, you all will have that. In the coming weeks, a video of tonight's live stream will be available on the A Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey under videos on demand. And if you'd enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey for more information about upcoming webinars, our Insights That Matter podcasts, and sign up for our monthly emails. Have a great night and stay well.